So what are we seeing? Large fitness only businesses will continue to struggle to retain members unless they can distinguish their business so it looks different or feels different from other businesses and they start to provide service. The big box operators have to start delivering on their promise. We charge you this, you get service. I can't think of any industry in the world where if I pay more, I don't get more service. When I fly, if I fly economy, there are two people to look after a hundred people in the economy. If I go business, there are two people to look after 50 people in business. If I fly first class, I don't. If I fly first class, or if I flew first class, there'd probably be five people to look after 10 people in first class. Every time you pay more, you expect higher level service. So if you're charging more money, people expect a higher quality of delivery and a higher quality of service. Budget operators, they're going to need to find ways of possibly changing the size of their business model. In the UK, we have a lot of budget operators now. And when I talk to them, they say to me, in a town or in a city, when there's just one of us and we open, we get great money. When there's two, we do okay. When there's three, all competing for the same low-cost market, it becomes more challenging. Some cities in the UK now have nine low-cost offers that each are designed to house 7,000 members, but there aren't 35,000 people in that city ready to do exercise at that price. So what we're seeing is a saturation of the market. So they're going to have to look at how they change. And we've already seen that the low cost operators have started to move from just having big box rooms with lots of equipment into much more stylish, more traditional looking fitness facilities. What I find interesting is if you interview people who join a, a boutique, no, sorry. If you interview people who've joined a budget club and they've previously been a member of a big box gym, they're always disappointed at the boutique. Even though they know it's going to cost less. Because in their heads, what they want it to really be is their big box gym but at low cost. And it never is. People who've never been a member of a gym before who join a, a budget, are always really impressed because they actually have nothing else to compare it to. So you actually get different member aspirations or experiences just based on their previous usage of facilities or not. The, the boutiques seem to do well for about 12 months and then we find people switching to another boutique. In London, we now have what are technically described as, not by me, 284 boutiques. That is a huge number of boutiques, even for a city the size of London. We have a population in London of 7 million, which is large compared to a lot of cities. But for me, it doesn't justify having that many boutiques. And those boutiques are now actually, we're starting to see price wars. So it was 35 pounds, then it's 25 pounds, then it's 20, then it's 15, and they're doing class pass. So then sometimes they're not only get, charging 15 pounds by class pass, they're not even getting all of the 15 pounds. They're getting a proportion of it. In order for these businesses to be successful, one, they have to outperform by delivering what they do better than the competition at the same level do. So low cost must be frictionless. It must be ease of use for the facility. There's got to be sufficient equipment that you don't have to queue. What we found is that lots of the low cost members like it being busy. Because it reassures them that they're in the right place. 
It's a little bit like you when you walk out of here, you walk past the restaurants. How many of you have looked in a restaurant that's empty and gone, no. And then you've walked past one that's got a decent amount of people in and gone, ooh, that looks good, and you're reassured by the number of people. But how many of you walk past the one that they're queuing down the road? You look, you go, oh, the queue's too long. So they have to strike that balance. People don't mind queuing at peak hours. They understand that at peak hours, you're going to be busy. It's a bit like on the freeway here. If you want to get on the freeway at six o'clock, is it going to be busy? Yes. Do you enjoy it? No. But you accept it because you know, well, that's peak hours. So what we're finding is that people are making decisions about using their clubs based on the experience they want to have. They will pay lots of money for a really high quality experience. They get very frustrated very quickly when they pay lots of money and don't get a quality experience. If you don't promise a high quality experience in terms of service, then you can deliver budget well as long as you're not over saturated with a number of other facilities around you. Because there's only so many people will actually want to purchase budget memberships. Last year, I joined four budget operators on January the 12th, all on the same day, to see what the joining processes would be like, to see what the member experience would be like. It's probably the least expensive research I've ever done. And I kept the memberships for six months. So I spent about £240 on a six-month research project. What did I conclude? Some are really actually bad at delivering low cost as well. But the biggest surprise, well perhaps not a surprise, was that I don't want to train in a low cost gym. When I go there, I don't like the feel of it, personally. I probably would have done in my 20s or 30s, but now I want something that's a bit more comfortable. I don't mind paying more, and I can afford to pay more. And this may be the wrong way of describing it. God. I might not get to do the second session today. <laughs> when someone said to me, what's the difference, Paul, between the big box gym that you're a member of and the low cost gyms that you're a member of, I said, it's got a different quality of drug dealer. <laughs> I said, all the drug dealers at my big box club drive Range Rovers and Mercedes. And what I perceive to be the drug dealers in the low cost walk. So people are going to make decisions about where they think they fit in as well as what they can afford. What we do know is except at the very high prices, price does not affect retention. Price is part of the buying decision. It's not part of the retention decision. It only becomes part of the retention decision when people are paying and not using. So if they've they joined for 12 months and they're paying but they're not going, then it becomes, well actually I did one workout this month, that cost me $60, that's an expensive workout. And I can guarantee you this, when they quit, they'll blame you. The fact that they're not going is not their responsibility. They'll blame you for not having enough equipment, the showers being cold, it not being clean enough, someone on reception not acknowledging them on the way in. So they disassociate from the reason they quit. The other thing I think we need to be really conscious of is we're not good at growing the population of exercises. Now I go to lots of conferences like this all around the world all the time and I love them. And I see the fitness community celebrating the fitness community. But sometimes like when I go onto the trade, floor, trade show floor here, some of the new exercise things are only designed for five people in my city. They're so intense and so hard that they're only, you know, it's, we keep going after the fitter, the fitter, the fitter, and the challenge is gonna be for us as an industry, in order to grow, we need to bring people in at a lower level and give them things that they can accomplish. We're really good at recycling the ones we've already got. 
but the markets will grow, and they can grow quite substantially, if we can find ways of delivering fitness in ways that are attractive to the, not the non-fit and the ones who never want to do it, but the ones who never go, I want to join the gym, I just haven't done it yet, to draw those people in. That is my presentation. I can't remember what time we're supposed to finish, so I don't know if we've got time for questions. I've got five minutes. If anyone wants to ask me a question, we'll do questions, you'll have to shout. Okay, the question I had here was what do I think between an annual contract and a month to month? Annual contracts are more difficult to sell. The people who buy them stay longer, not just in the first year, but over years. Month to month, you can sell lots of them, but they go really quickly. So you need to really consider how much commission you pay on a month to month, because your salespeople can sell a lot of them, even though that's not going to give you a lot of return to the business long term. I'd always have both, where you can, I'd sell 12 month agreements, as opposed to month to month. The one thing I would say is, if you're working with a sales team, and I hear this all the time, and what I notice in the language as a psychologist, I hear people, sales people say, if you want to, this is to someone who hasn't yet signed up, if you want to, you can quit this month, at the end of the month, if you want to. They haven't yet joined, and we're telling them when they can quit. So we're actually planting that idea, so at the end of the first month, they go, I can quit now, where's my body? I better quit because you didn't give me what I paid for. So I always have both, even in the low cost. I always say to low cost, have a 12 month option. Don't take it away from people. Say, it's month, month by month is what we mainly do, but you could also do this if you wanted to. So I'd always have both. Yes, sir. As a strategy, do you recommend using a big box gym with a gym with a gym with a gym? Uh, yeah, I do. I really like the idea, but the first thing that comes to mind right now is Dave Barton Clubs. Dave Barton Clubs. Dave Barton Clubs for me were the, were the originator of like unique exercise experience in terms of the design of their businesses. And if you look up on Google, Dave Barton Clubs, you'll see the designs they use. They've recently gone bankrupt. They're a big box. They've gone bankrupt, they put a boutique cycle program in their business. The problem I think they had, I know they've got a few financial problems, but the problem I think they had was their member was exactly the type of person that wants to go to a boutique, which is the latest, the most fashionable, and something slightly different. So in, in, Los, in New York, where they had these, these beautiful clubs with people where there was like no judgment, you know, that I walked into one and there was a transvestite on reception with her hair up and she's like, hello honey! And I'm like, hi! And it was really, really quirky, if, if that translates. Apologies, it's really just different. You know, they're accepting of all sorts of people. But those are also the people who want to go to boutiques because that's the new fashionable place to be seen. So I think you have to be careful I think you have to design your facilities so your facilities don't look like everybody else's facilities. And you have to deliver a service in a way that you deliver service or a package that stands out. So I'm not sure that you can mix both of them in that way. And so I'd just be cautious of that. Correct. Yeah. Okay, so the question is from Connie, I'll come to you in a second, sir. The question from Connie is, have I seen in all the clubs I visit, and I get to see somewhere between 50 and 100 clubs a year, have I seen any concepts that I think will grow the market? No. Is almost my straight answer. You know, every emerging market I go to, people say, oh, you know, if I say to you, I was in China, people go, what do clubs look like in China? They look like clubs here. They have treadmills and bikes and showers and 
You know, clubs look the same all over the world. The offering is pretty much the same all over the world. Everybody I met in China last week, as, as lovely as they were, were just trying to copy and replicate what they see everywhere else in the world. Because it's the fastest way of growing their businesses. As uncomfortable as it, it's not uncomfortable for me to say, but it might be some uncomfortable for other people to hear it. JCCs, YMCAs, community type facilities, even faith based fitness facilities, probably do a better job of growing the broader market than the health club industry itself. Because actually they're connected to those communities first in other ways that then get them to exercise. So they go to that church and then become an exerciser because it's part of their church community or their community of the YMCA or the JCC. So I think those, they, have, they are actually better at it because they don't go in it fitness first, they go community first, oh, and we have this. But it's probably, uh, it's probably not the best place to say that. No. Can I do his question and I will come to you? Yes, so You sir. may have commented on this. Would you say that the growth of the boutique segment is due to people leaving big boxes yeah. or are they keeping the big box membership and just increasing their discretionary spend at the boutiques? Are basically the boutiques yeah. earning the money, the non-dues revenue that the clubs are always yeah. going after but haven't been Definitely. paid? So, so we're not seeing attrition in the big boxes due to boutiques, we're just seeing a, a greater well, spend. Yes, so let me repeat the question just for the translators. So the question is, are we seeing the boutiques growing because they're growing a unique market? Or is it that the members from the big boxes are also supplementing their big box membership with a boutique workout? This would usually be a secondary revenue source for the big boxes, but that secondary revenue source is actually being earned by the boutiques. And I do see that. Now, the follow-up is, do you think, in your opinion, and you kind of touched on it, do you think it's an effective strategy for the big boxes to try to have small studios within the big box or should those same entities launch studios themselves so they're earning that revenue rather than a different entity okay so the question is for the translators should the big boxes try and do boutiques either within their big boxes or as a way of combating boutiques should they launch their own boutique type studios my opinion at the moment is this most of the big box operators i meet aren't sufficiently in tune with what I think a boutique is to run boutiques. They can copy the size, they can copy the, the look, they can give it lots of marketing, but they don't have the unique insight that someone who started a business in that way does. And you know, I, I work with lots of the big box operators and we're constantly looking now at ways of combating you know what, increasing that secondary speed. They've Barton brought in Cycle as a unit, as a boutique in their basement in their Astor Place Club because they said, we're not good at delivering that experience. So we'll make it available to bring other people in. But that hasn't worked for them. So I'd like to think that the big box, I think what we'll see in the big boxes is they won't be as big going forward. So instead of clubs aimed at five, 6,000 members, the big boxes will be aimed at four, three to 4,000 members. Now, whether some of those boxes can actually operate at that revenue level, you know, they've lost 2,000 members, can they still make that a profitable business? I don't know. That's going to depend on their deals that they've done with their landlords or the purchasing price. Um, but I do think the big boxes are going to struggle to compete with the boutiques. But I also think the boutiques are struggling to compete with other boutiques now because they're stealing from each other. And I think that we're going to see a, a re not a huge price war, but there's going to be a much bigger push on price to keep people in boutiques as opposed to the experience. You had a question. I'm going to do one more, and then we'll do any others outside, if that's all right. Just Paul, go. OK, so the question was, can I elaborate the calculations for annual retention rate, client retention rate. Difficult to do it here because it's a statistical method and not only three people would leave, everybody would leave. If you email me, I've got a 15 minute video that explains how to do each of the calculations. I think that would be the easiest way to do it. 
Thank you very much for your time this afternoon. I appreciate it a lot.